So I've heard that people for, that have severe mental illness really can't recover. Is that true? Oh, no, that's not true at all. Uh, that, that's a common myth, though. And a lot of people somehow, I mean, they've gotten that impression. And, uh, but in fact, people can and do recover from even the most severe forms of mental illness. I know personally, because I've gone through it. I was diagnosed with schizophrenia in my 20s, and then I became a psychiatrist, and I've been practicing for 30 years, and I've met many, many other people like myself. But the myth is continuing. That, that myth is continuing. And what do you mean by recover? Well, that's a good question. Uh, it's, it's not exactly like recovery from substance abuse, where you know somebody basically just doesn't use a substance for lengthy periods of time. Um, by recovery, we really mean having a full life in the community where you are able to make the decisions, important decisions in your own life. And you're able to, um, really gets back to Freud, to have love and work. And uh, of those two, the most important is to have loving relationships and to have a social network of friends and of, uh, of intimate relationships uh, so that you feel that your life is worth living. That sounds great. But? Is it possible? <laughs> you seem skeptical. <laughs> well, it's, it's not only possible, but the hope of it is an important component. Um, one of the worst things that can happen is that people be told that they will never recover. Because it, by ta that takes hope away. And without hope, there's no reason to get up. There's no reason to, to form a friendship. There's no reason to think about work and people retreat into hopelessness. Does it really work for people who are very impaired? Uh, can they really make that kind of significant progress? Yes, they can and they do. Yeah, and studies, long-term studies have shown that this occurs. But they need, they need the right mix of supports, relationships, belief, uh, a, a culture of recovery around them. Everybody plays a role everybody who has contact with them because it's in the hearts of each of the persons who have contact with them. If you can carry hope in your heart, you can share that hope with another person. And if you can reach them in the most human of levels and the most equal of levels, then you can draw out from them their capacity to experience their own humanity. So it's not just about having the right therapist or the right medication? No. Although therapy and medication can be helpful, almost everybody, we've done, long, we've done studies through the National Empowerment Center of what were the most important elements in people's recovery. Number one was someone who believed in me. Absolutely at the top of almost everybody's list. And it wasn't necessarily a therapist. It could be a therapist or it could be another psychiatrist. But very often it was uh, somebody of less status but who was able to make a human connection. Somebody who remembered my birthday and sent me a, a birthday card. Somebody who, when I felt that I couldn't really go out for a job interview, said, you can do it. I believe you can make it. A um, recreation therapist, a, a residential therapist, um, a, a friend in the family. For myself, one of the most important people is actually my brother-in-law, and uh, I was I'd just been uh, gotten out of my second hospitalization, and I'd been told I had schizophrenia and that uh, I would never really recover from this. And, uh, but I had in my heart a dream that I would change the system so that people didn't have to go through such a distressing experience. So uh, I talked to my brother-in-law, and, and he was a doctor, and I said, I think I want to go to medical school, and I want to become a psychiatrist, and I want to change the system, so people don't have to be hospitalized, and don't have to be given dreadful diagnoses, but are given hope and given support. And he said, I believe you can do it. I believe you can make it. And that, that made such a difference. It was, uh, he didn't say, you know, oh, that's an unrealistic expectation. I had to do a lot of hard work to do it, though. I, going back to school was not easy. I think some people would be worried that we're going to set people up, that it's too much of false an expectation. False hopes. Oh, people are always saying this. False hopes. Oh, yeah. I've, I've been publicly, people have said, he's giving people false hopes. Well, I think that's better than false hopelessness. That's what we're giving people right now, false hopelessness. I'll give you another example. There was a boy. He was 13 years old. And uh, it was out in Oregon. 
So I'm giving this talk. Usually there aren't so many adolescents there, and I wish there were more because I'd like to reach kids at an earlier age. And uh, their attitudes are very important. That's when they're forming. And he was squirming around. He didn't say very much. And his mother came up to me uh, at the break. Uh, she she uh, gone home and she came back and, and she said he, he's. He, I said, what did he, your son get out of that? And she said, I think you saved his life. I said, whoa, that's how how that happen? And she said, when he was 10 years old, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and he was told he would have it for the rest of his life. He'd be on medication the rest of his life. And he was told he would never recover. She said, he's been suicidal ever since. She said, he had never had heard until today from you that anyone could recover from either bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or any of these kind of conditions. And she said, now, he said, he has hope. And he was given false hopelessness, and that can lead to suicide. Because hope actually is one of the most central predictors how hopeful someone feels about whether they will commit suicide. That's, that's, if someone feels hopeless, they are at risk, really, of suicide. So there's actually a lot more risk and danger in traditional modes of service provision than we generally think about. I think that it's more risky, yes, in several ways. Traditional services increase the risk, I believe, of, uh, of, of people either harming themselves or at times maybe even harming other people. And one of the major reasons is that um, traditional service, by taking away hope, they make people withdraw, withdraw from the world. But also, um, in traditional services, there is, there is a threat that if you don't behave and if you don't uh, conform and comply and take your medicine, that you'll be put in a hospital. Well, this is a fear-based system, and it doesn't build alliance. It builds compliance but not alliance. And basically people, and I, I know I went through this myself, don't want to share the, the uncertainties or the insecurities or the fears or the, the unusual thinking that might come up for fear they'll be hospitalized. So, they keep it quiet. That's a higher risk. Because then you don't have the trust, you don't have the communication, you don't have the openness. I'm thinking a lot about um, what it is that uh, I feel is most important often and what somebody can do to help somebody recover. And, and we have this, this term, somebody who believes in you, that's very important. Uh, people who connect at a human level, people who respect you. Uh, people who trust you and that you trust. So the, all these are sort of two-way um, uh, relationships. Um, showing your feelings is very important as a person who's providing the assistance, that you're a real human being, that you're genuine. They all add up in a way to be able to express love and to feel in your heart as a person who's helping somebody that you love the person that you're helping. And this, to me, is, is an essential aspect. And we don't talk about it in psychiatry and, and, and mental health very much because people always they get worried, oh, it's a boundary issue, you're going to get romantically involved, or, and you, know, you have lonely people and they're going to misinterpret it. But honestly, I believe that without love, there probably won't be very much recovery, that there can't be recovery, because people have, they, they, they feel so alienated. I mean, I felt so alienated from the world when I was in the depths of my own despair, um, I, I really did have to decide at some point that life was worth living. And, and what <laughs> ironically brought me through that night was that I loved my cat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and loving someone else can be as important as receiving love. Um, I felt that I really needed to take care of that cat, and, and I was afraid that no one else would. Um, then. Gradually, I fell in love, um, and that, that was uh, and remains very, very important to me. But I love the people that I help, too. And um, I feel that if, if I'm able to reach them in my heart, then they, their heart will warm also. And they, in their heart, can then help someone else.